Hello and welcome to session 28. Right. Um, all right, so we've had these wonderful discussions now um, around uh, bridging theory practice, meeting the needs of the world of work, uh, unpacking um, what we actually want students to learn. I'm thinking of my science colleagues in, in the science faculty uh, who had made wonderful use of um, different instruments to analyze semantics. I'm thinking of the analysis of kinds of questions and how the tools have really helped their students to, or help them as educators to see um, what kinds of questions they're asking, what's in the assessment. Uh, I need to pull this out the way because I can't see what on earth I'm supposed to be doing here. Sorry, you guys, let me just move you to over there. Thank you. Right, now we've seen the science faculty and we've seen some of these uh, engineering case studies, um, but this session is really about, okay, what happens when we put science and engineering together? Or what happens when we look at uh, STEM more broadly? Now, for those who uh, were in an earlier session, you know, some of this uh, 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 is it's not repeated in the same way, but we're just going to point out again that the complexities in the STEM space. So, I mean, the problems in STEM education are global, okay? But in Africa in particular, you know, we're really talking about fundamental social, uh, um, sustainable development goals, talking about economic progress, um, and we have such low numbers enrolling in STEM. Um, we have complaints about the, the STEM graduates that we're producing are um, not competent enough. That's also a global thing. You know, attracting and retaining STEM students is this whole worldwide phenomenon, as I've said. Um, one of the reasons is that the heavily theoretical curriculum in some of our traditional research intensive university contexts doesn't facilitate practices that are really required in the real, in real world contexts. Um, as we've seen earlier from our colleagues, you know, our assessment approaches are sometimes, um, well, I'm going to say a hit and miss matter because um, our assessment doesn't enable, you know, learning through failure, um, which is one of the best ways to learn. Um, so in response to all of these, we've seen in the examples previously, especially in the engineering uh, case study examples, we've seen more active learning approaches, project-based learning, you know, workplace learning, um, semantic waving, but so many of the approaches, whilst intuitively on the right track, often only work in small, very well-resourced environments. And very often, as somebody said in the earlier session, you know, one does this intuitively and then realizes when you have a tool like, like several of those offered by legitimation code theory, aha, wow, this is actually what I was doing. So there's the synergistic relationship between using these tools and also experiencing and observing what's happening in your field of practice. Now, another dilemma that we have is that all this practical education that we're talking about can seriously limit students' conceptual grasp and if we try to compete with the practical or real world education that they're gonna receive once they are in the real world, we can't. The contexts are simply too complex. So, and if we try and teach them the technologies that are out there, they're not gonna be relevant by the time those students graduate. Okay, so we need a better way to understand how to teach STEM that will enable our students to legitimately participate in society. It sounds like a song from me. I use the, those terms all the time. And contribute to solving 21st century socioeconomic and technical challenges. Now, engineering is a fantastic example of STEM because it is the relationship between sciences and technologies in service of and in response to society and nature. But each of these areas highlighted on this little graph that you can see over here, implies different ways of thinking, different kinds of practices, different kinds of dispositions even. Um, and the problem solving graduates in our STEM, in our collective collaborative STEM space needs to navigate these different ways of thinking and the different kinds of practices. 
And that requires maybe a different tool to look at this. And here comes my favorite LCT tool. <laughs> so the epistemic plane is something that can help us to understand those differences in that STEM space, because it's an instrument that helps us to differentiate between the what and how of any knowledge practice. So this vertical axis is about what is being addressed in any practice, the phenomenon itself, how strongly bounded it is. So a strongly bounded phenomenon, concepts like gravity and laws of motion, et cetera, has what we call strong optic relations. A weakly bounded phenomenon at the other end, or a weaker bounded phenomenon, is one which needs a context, or it's ambiguous, or it really is different in different cases. Concepts like justice, concepts like love, for example, are different from concepts like gravity and even osmosis. Um, the horizontal axis is about how we approach these phenomena from fixed standardized approaches to weaker open-ended approaches. And then each quadrant represents a fundamentally different way of thinking. So the top right is about a clearly bounded phenomenon with standardized procedures. So many of the natural sciences would fit in there. The bottom right quadrant is ways of thinking dictated by methods. Top left quadrant is about the phenomenon is quite clear, but how we approach it will be dictated by the situation. There are multiple possible methods. The bottom left quadrant is about a practice where the phenomenon isn't clear and neither is the approach, either because nobody knows what's going on or the practice itself is dictated by different organizing principles, such as those by the players themselves uh, or knowers in LCT language. Now, each of these quadrants demonstrates a different kind of insight. And those disciplines that I spoke about that we see as different kinds of disciplines can also be mapped where the, where the dominant orientation of a particular discipline is in a specific quadrant. Now, the important point here is that it's not about getting stuck in a quadrant. It's about moving, about code shifting, about recognizing different ways of thinking at different stages of any knowledge practice. So these are just examples from my own research on successful engineering problem solvers in industry, in different, in, in different contexts. And what you can see here is those fundamental disciplines we spoke about. Over here, green was for the natural sciences, red was for the mathematical sciences, Blue was for the technologies and logic-based sciences, and purple was always knower, knowery stuff. And what you can see here is that when a successful, legitimate participant in the socio-technical world draws on all these different disciplinary forms of knowledge, they do it in such a way that they approach the same form of knowledge in a different way at a different moment during this problem-solving process, because that's what this was about. So what we're going to do now in this session is we're going to look at an example of what we call code shifting in where the home base is in four different kind of categories. In the natural sciences, Robbie Pott is going to be talking about enabling that shifting. Those pictures you saw of those successful problem solvers that's about enabling successful code shifting. Each of these is going to talk about how that happens in a specific way in his or her context. So that we can, uh, so this gives us a way to look at uh, this collaboration and the space that science and engineering occupy in, in the bigger STEM space. So Robbie, when you're ready, um, I'm gonna stop sharing now and you can take over and share your presentation. Okay, give me a moment while I try and figure out Zoom. I'm used to Teams rather. Uh, where are you? Share screen. There we go, perfect. We can see the notes. 
we can see huh. that let's present in my note there we go right okay can you see all right so i i i'm going to quickly run you through some stuff that i presented in a, in a paper that uh Cara and i did on fluid mechanics and and the idea here is is this is an example of how i used uh the epistemic plane to look at um at my practices in, in fluid mechanic teaching um to try and better understand uh are there any gaps where are the spaces you know what am i doing so that i can then decide is what i'm doing the correct thing um or should i be changing things so fluid mechanics to give you a bit of context for those maybe not engineers is a sit as a core subject in the second year um in both chemical and mechanical engineering it is one of the first kind of uh, engineering courses uh, where we start to move from a strong science focus so it's not maths and chemistry it's engineering in the context of, of fluid mechanics um chem, uh, fluid mechanics and other engineering courses uh, they have quite a large theoretical content um but they also have a, a large um, um or a lot of uh applied or theoretical um stuff then is applied to, to specific contexts um so we're trying to move in both directions in other words, we're trying to do the science and we're trying to to do like the the hands on the nitty-gritty use the pumps actually build the stuff um we, we can't just focus on on the tools for instance manipulating the navier stokes navier stokes equations or calculating pump efficiency or those kind of like very mathematical things uh we also need to focus on problem solving so they need to take those tools and be able to contextually apply them and use them in, in problem solving so so in other words the tools are only really useful um when they're applied when they, when they actually have application um so what do you want to do what i'm going to try and work through now is is how do we understand these opposing requirements and how we can visualize uh, the implicit choices that we make in teaching and learning okay so Karen's introduced the plan. I don't need to go through it again. Um, so I'm going to go through the various types of things that we do in courses and, and how I've understood how this situates itself in uh, in the epistemic plan. So we start with lectures, and lectures sit very um, very far to the top top right. They're dialectic discussions of high level concepts. Occasionally we bring them down down to the level of examples um, or calculation. They sit very firmly, therefore, in this, this purest insight quadrant. Um, the things are very well defined. The methodology is very well, well defined. We explicitly talk about it. Um, occasionally, we'll pull threads from the situational insight quadrant. For instance, the lecturer may ask, uh, how do we decide on the pump requirements for a particular reactor configuration? So in other words, there's, uh, there are a few ways that one could approach that, but then we pull it down to, uh, to some specific instances. Um, there's generally very little discussion in, in these uh, in, in lectures on, on what we could consider the knower inside quadrant. The type of person doesn't matter. Uh, the type of person doing the calculations isn't particularly important. Um, and of course, educators will recognize that, that attending lectures is not nearly sufficient for excellent learning. And potentially, it's because of this re relatively stationary situation in this top, top right hand corner. Um, although, of course, there's, there's more than that. Um, the next thing that we follow up with from particularly in, in what we do with Salenbosch's tutorials, there is space in which students give are given a number of problems and questions, usually a long list of things, sometimes they're from the textbook. Um, and while the lecturer and student assistants walk around uh, and answer questions, this is obviously based in the non COVID context where uh, during COVID tutorials were um, the, the five students who, who came bothered to come and so forth. But anyway, so the tutorials. From the student's perspective, this, for the most part, sits within the doctrinal insight quadrant. It's because they recognize and reproduce what they've seen in, in the textbook. So they, they look at the shape of the problem and they try and resolve it, and, and, and so we go. Um, but if you are clever with your question setting, you can have some motion up towards the purest insight quadrant when the students don't simply recognize the shape of the question, where they don't uh, take an algorithmic approach. Uh, but rather recognize underlying principles and the relevance and the difference between each question. So that the the um, the onus then sits with the lecturer to to devise these questions in such a way that there is such pull, um, or walk around and ask questions like, okay, well, why do we apply this the Navier-Stokes equation in this particular embodiment for this kind of question? Um, 
we have a continuing and ongoing discussion around how undergraduate engineering education in particular, the students can adopt a, a superficial learning route um, through pattern recognition. And I've, I've written with, with another colleague, uh, Sunel Nakia, on, on how this happens in, in uh, reactor design. And it, it's very easy to, for it to fall into that. And students can hide behind recognizing the pattern of the algorithm rather than grappling with the fundamentals. So they stay very, <laughs> very grounded down in, in the, in the Oh, well, minus they, they know exactly what to do, but they don't understand why they're doing it and, and, and how it, how it uh, is more generally applicable. Um, so this is a very narrow transverse between the dot and the first insights. So they get stuck in there, you know, then they're not progressing. Um, so potentially what I propose is maybe what's needed is a move towards more situational insights where students are required to uh, pull on the range of tools, all the tools that we have in that bag of fluid mechanics, select one and apply it to a defined problem. In other words, we go from the, the situational quadrant and then pull it across. So that's where we'd like to go. And one way uh, to do that is through practicals where you have students that are given a, a physical embodiment problem that they've got to solve. They presented with an open-ended task, preferably, um, where they need to employ the theory, in other words, pull this uh, open-ended task from, from the situational quadrant into the purest quadrant, and then um, do some calculation stuff which might pull them down into the dot panel. So, so there's a tra traversal of, um, of the plane, um, and then if there's group work involved well, then potentially you're going to have some, some professional skills, uh, which then requires lower, lower insight as well. So that's what, what should hopefully happen in practicals. Uh, in reality, what often happens is uh, that the students arrive, they're not prepared, they just, you know, they want the, the student supervisor the, or the mentor to, to tell them what button to press and, and they, they get the data and they go. So um, it's, it's difficult to make sure that, that the, the um, practical does extend over the whole range and doesn't fall down into this, um, into this low utility case where, where they're not really engaging. They're, they're again, reproducing or, um, or, or simply reproducing what other people have done, um, where calculations are performed, performed by rote. Um, we're dissolve, devolving into no insight. We're limited learning in certain ways. Um, so an understanding of, of how we shift this from a useful exercise to a wasted effort could then allow our lecturers to put in place mechanisms that stimulate the kind of activities which do lead to traversal of this plane and therefore what we hope is some kind of cumulative learning and discouraging the wasted effort of, of poor learning. Difficult to do in larger classes and um, creative thinking is needed, but that's the point of this tool is that oh, we can see that no, well, practicals in theory, they should be you know, up towards situational, but in reality, they can be down there to, I don't know what's going on, I'm just going to arrive and my group mates will do it for me. Um, because we can see that difference, we can then put in place things which, which can try and resolve that. And then another example uh, of a thing that we do in, in the courses that we have is an assignment where an open-ended, significantly situational problem is posed. It allows students time um, to explore various possible routes to solutions. In other words, it's very strong situational insight. And then once the methodology is arrived at, then they go through the problem through purist and doctrinal insights where they have to think about how it's applied, do the calculations, understand the calculations, pull it back up and what the implications are. Um, what else did I wanna say here? Oh, there are a number of approaches that the students could take to solve this being a fairly well-defined problem in this case, it's only second year, so we don't want to give them too difficult. By the time the final year comes along, then it can be a difficult design problem. Um, in order to solve it well, they need to pull on explicitly covered material, for instance, in, in the cases that we do, um, calculate pressure losses, use pump characteristic curves and so forth, um, and then they pull that down. Yeah. Um, however, there can be other concepts which they need to consider in an assignment, which are not explicitly part of the fluids curriculum, things like Will the fluid corrode the piping material? Is there seasonal variation in the flow rates? Is there effective temperature significant? So if I'm building this pump station in the Karoo and it goes up to 50, is my pump going to break? Or is, it, is there something else going to happen? Um, is the pump I've chosen very expensive or not available? So that then is pulling on, on things that are, are much more in the lower quadrant or the situational quadrant. It's, it's different uh, to then just the, the application of the theory. 
Now, having had a think about what we're doing in the course, now let's contrast it with what, what industry wants, what the world of work wants. Um, a significant portion of what employers consider important requires lower insight rather than this very strong knowledge requirement. I mean, the, the knowledge requirement is also there, but, but they, they often want things like teamwork, communication, ethics, other soft or professional skills. Um, the problems presented to real working engineers are firmly within the situational insight quadrant, things like we have wastewater we can treat it. What should we do? Clearly, for that kind of situation, there's multiple routes to, to a proper solution. Uh, we'll open that bag of tools that we have and pull out the fluid mechanics, pull out the reactor design. Um, we need to have both detailed knowledge of the specific methodologies, in other words, pulling across to the right-hand side of this plane, but we also need to do it in a way where you know, we're communicating with the client, we are uh, presenting it to them, we're doing it as part of a team, maybe with something that like, so, so it's a lot more complicated and it is clear that a significant portion of what we do in industry is focused on the left-hand side of this quadrant, whereas almost entirely what happens in the classroom is focused on the right-hand side. Um, our primary modes of learning are, um, are stuck on the right. So there's maybe, this is maybe a reason why there's a, a clash here and that we're getting feedback from industry and recent graduates that they're not sufficiently prepared for the world of work. They're not talking about the, um, the technical content. The technical content they've got down, they spend a lot of work on that, effort on that. What they don't have down is the other stuff, all this other stuff that's on the left hand side. So what we're doing here is visualizing the existing dominant codes and the clashes or the, or the you know, box of positions, mismatches. Um, and it is the first step in understanding where our curricula currently lie and it provides an opportunity for designing or thinking about or proposing some progressive pedagogies and interventions, which then can bridge these gaps. Um, and hopefully that will then result in an improved cumulative learning, both on the technical side, rather than being stuck down at the bottom in the very uh, algorithmic approach, but also give them some uh, sort of contextual understanding of how, how real engineers interact with, with real problems in, in actual design issues. So that is my spiel on fluid mechanics. That's fantastic. You can stop sharing, Robbie. Um, from a timing perspective, if you have questions for Robbie, please put them um, into the chat for now. We're going to you know, consolidate and pull this together, uh, but I am just conscious of the time. Um, uh, Ingrid Rivitsky, our colleague in the Faculty of Science, is next, and I'm just going to share the screen because I'm going to share from my side, but Ingrid is actually going to talk us through these. Ingrid, so you tell me if you're ready and you're there. And there we go. Thank you, Karen. Um, so understanding the complexities of mathematical proficiency of students entering tertiary education has been identified as an important as very important for improving student success in STEM programs. And the epistemic plane that Karen described, together with my own reflections as a mathematician, inspired the theoretical framework I've been using for illuminating different insights of mathematical proficiency and providing possible strategies for developing such proficiency. So I adapt ontic relations to refer to what mathematical knowledge and discursive relations to refer to how one thinks or reasons. It is expected that for a mathematical object of study in a mathematics module, students knowledge of a certain mathematical claim about that object may vary from not knowing that the claim holds to simply knowing that the claim holds to knowing why the claim holds. Also, a student's way of expressing their understanding may have stronger or weaker levels of mathematical formalism. And in this way, the stronger and weaker ontic relations may be identified along a continuum of mathematical knowledge, and the stronger and weaker discursive relations may be identified along a continuum of more or less mathematical formalism. 
and then at right angles um, to each other. These continue from four quadrants as depicted here, each representing an insight of mathematical proficiency. There's no right or wrong insight. However, when embarking on a mathematical study, a certain insight may be a preferred starting point over the others. And then success in mathematical thinking and reasoning requires insight shifting, which involves strengthening or weakening ontic relations and or the discursive relations. So in particular, one might abstract from a personal representation or an intuitive reasoning into more mathematical representations and formal reasoning techniques. So that means you're shifting towards stronger discursive relations. We may acquire knowledge of the underlying mathematical ideas and principles, which then involve shifting towards stronger ontic relations. We may generalize from a specific instance of a mathematical concept or technique to a more encompassing mathematical concept or technique. And this would involve shifting from a situational insight to possibly a doctrinal insight. On the other hand, one might specialize from a general concept to instances, um, and there one could be shifting from the purest insight to the situational. And then one may link or apply, if possible, the mathematical knowledge and skills to a personal experience or a real world phenomena, and that would be shifting towards the knower insight. Now, each of these insights provides a significant challenge when developing mathematical proficiency about any mathematical topic. And different levels of mathematical proficiency may be described in terms of different insights navigated. So in particular, a basic level will be entirely in the doctrinal insight and an intermediate level will draw on two different insights, typically the doctrinal and the situational. And a higher level of proficiency will draw on three insights as the needs for abstraction, generalization, or specialization demand. And with artifactive strategies for facilitating insight shifting, there's a potential for clashes. So for example, Mathematicians may be working in the purest insight, while most students may be entirely in the doctrinal or situational insight where less mathematical formalism and rigor is used. And another potential clash arises for mathematical topics that have emerged entirely in the purest insight without any link to the real world phenomenon. So in the remaining time, I'll just give you a quick example and Karen can move on to the next slide, please. Um, the example would be to think about the mathematical activity of finding areas. So all first year students will know that the area of a circle may be found using the formula pi r squared. And they'll also know how to use that formula mathematically, for example, to find the area of a circle given its radius or its diameter. So that's the doctrinal insight. Unfortunately, few students will know why this is the case. However, people have known, at least since biblical times, that there is a way to divide a cake or a piece of land between two people so that neither is envious of the other. One person cuts and the other one chooses. And this is a knower insight. And then properties of the whole may be determined in terms of properties of those two parts. Now, abstracting from this to the circle cut into segments, the area of the circle may be found in some of the areas of those segments, and that's a situational insight. Then reasoning formally in terms of what we call Riemann sums in maths and the definite integral, we get a very formal definition of the formula for an area, and that is the purest insight. So therefore, a strategy for developing the proficiency in a mathematical activity, such as the one I've explained here, may involve moving from the doctrinal insight to the knower insight, and then from there to the situational, and then finally to the purest. The biggest challenge in this part, of, in, in this particular shifting, would be the generalization that is needed to move from the situational to the purest insight. 
And in my own teaching, I use this framework as a differentiated support model um, for my students. Thank you, Karen. Oh, that's fantastic. I, when you sent me these slides yesterday and I looked at this, I had light bulb moments going on here as well. Um, I'm going to ask you to do the same thing. If you have questions about these specific subject areas and the code shifting strategies and how they're seeing that, please put the questions um, into the chat. Um, we will have time to discuss and pull these together um, after we've got two more quadrants to deal with. So uh, we're going to look at, well, what I've called decolonization here. And this comes from an earlier talk and a, a strategy in terms of um, designing curriculum or engineering curricula, where we really do attend to all of that stuff on the left-hand side of the plane. So I'm going to showcase a couple of examples that you're going to see a lot of knowers now, but it's about, it's from the perspective of situational insight, where the specific situation or context here is the issue of STEM in Africa, was that the theme of STEM is what we're uh, focusing on for this session. Now, what I'm going to talk about here is going to be different for our colleagues in Europe or the USA or Australasia or the Americas or South America. And we have many from Latin America as well. Now, in our particular situation, we can enable code shifting and more open-ended approaches by introducing a broader range of approaches to particular concepts and introducing a different way of looking at some of the concepts. So we all know Einstein, who developed the famous equation that described the relation between energy and mass, which led to the creation of the atomic bomb. So this would be seen as a fixed phenomenon with fixed approaches, in other words, requiring purest insight. But students can be helped to grasp such phenomena Coming from a situational perspective, our students in Africa could be helped to grasp this by looking at other contributors. Samira Musa, for example, from Egypt, she developed the equation to break the atoms of cheap metals, making the medical applications of nuclear technology, such as X-rays, more accessible. So here we see an alternative technological approach dictated by context, an, al an alternative, not an alternative, and another contributor to a fundamental concept that can help our students to make the connection to the concept. Um, Newton needs no introduction. He's credited with much of the modern science and physics principles that underpin current day technologies and all the phenomena that we, we've been talking about in the last few sessions, uh, but specifically the validation of the theories through the scientific method, which is that whole fixed kind of doctrinal approach. But Ibn al hayatham from the Middle East in modern day Iraq documented his use of the scientific method 700 years before Newton. Wouldn't it be interesting to take a look at different methods in service of the same problem as a means to develop doctrinal insight? Uh, when we go up to our situational quadrant, in other words, enabling code shifting around conceptual or methodological or situational grasp by drawing on alternative knowers in these spaces. So Mark Zuckerberg needs no introduction. He built his empire to connect people, but it's entirely dependent on infrastructure such as devices, bandwidth, reliable connectivity, etc. In our African context, for example, Jamila Abbas in Kenya created an accessible, easy to use mobile platform that enables farmers to access real-time price information for specific crops in the regions in which they live. It's the first virtual marketplace for small scale farmers in Kenya. Now here again is an example of a situation dictating the use of an alternative technology, an alternative approach to the same fundamental phenomenon. Ontic relations here are strong. We wanna communicate better, but the approach can be totally different because in our African context, we don't have the kind of bandwidth and infrastructure and devices and resources that they have in other parts of the world. Um, when we move down into our NOAA quadrant, 
we see Diane Fossey, who made the film Gorillas in the Mist, famous, uh, originally a biologist. Now she's the woman who worked tirelessly to protect gorillas in the region between Rwanda and the DRC, Democratic Republic of Congo. Now, Wangari Matai, however, she also originally studied biology. And here's the first African woman to win the Nobel Prize. She founded the Greenbelt Movement, an environmental non-governmental NGO focused on the planting of trees, environmental conservation, and women's rights. So the suggestion here, in terms of enabling the development of these code shifting practitioners, is that by introducing students to a broader range of knowers engaged in STEM knowledge practices, we can help them to contextualize and enrich their grasp of fundamental concepts and different approaches to those concepts. So same thing applies. Uh, this was rather short and sweet. If you want to ask me any questions, we can pick these up later. We're now going to move on to our fourth quadrant. And our colleague Megs Blackie is going to talk to us about knower insight. Max, when you're Thanks. ready, I'm, go I'm going to stop sharing because we are Thanks. going to do this in a different way. We're focusing on knowers now. Thanks, Karen. Um, and if anyone wants to switch on their video just for this next, next few minutes, that would sort of serve to illustrate the point. So we're now looking at that uh, knower or no insight. And I think that the, for me, the challenge has been really recognizing the significance of the individual person who is developing this knowledge. So the idea of powerful knowledge comes from the sociology of knowledge in the 1990s. This idea that there is always somebody who is enacting the knowledge. And so there is an agent who is putting this knowledge into action. And for the most part in science, we almost want to paper that person over. We want to say, science is science is science. If I do this reaction in Cape Town, or if I do this reaction in Sydney, or if I do it in Mumbai, I'm going to get the same result. And that is entirely true because uh, you, drawing on critical realism here, there is a real mechanism that we are invoking to create that reaction. The Grignard reaction that I do in Cape Town will be repeatable provided I am able to articulate what I've done clearly. Somebody will be able to reproduce uh, that work. But what that fails to recognize is the creative genius of the person who first conduct that experiment. And, the, and I think as soon as you begin to think about that, all of us who are scientists will recognize that our own curiosity drives much of the work that we do. My own PhD project was my first PhD project. That's a slightly irritating sentence. My first PhD project was um, uh, making new antimalarial drugs that happened to have um, metallocene uh, moieties in them. And that came entirely from the fact that I wanted to do a medicinal chemistry project. I had done an honors project in, a, in an organometallic lab. And so combining these two things sounded cool to me. That research project is continuing and Pranessa Challen is, is, uh, continues to work out of that original project that was devised basically to keep me happy um, in my master's in 1999. So there's a particularity of the knower that we, we tend to paper over. And that then can look like the, the, uh, and how that, how, how that becomes problematic is that the, I, the ideal scientist is the rational person, which is configured, embodied far too often in the body of the white cisgendered heterosexual male. And what that does is that if we realize that provided we're all talking about the, a common canon of knowledge, so provided we've all um, gone around that uh, epistemic plane and, and effectively got, got to the point where we can uh, engage the situational insight, 
if we're talking with colleagues at that level, then if we're talking to people who have had slightly different training, maybe I've done biochemistry and you've done microbiology, we will bring different questions to bear on to the same problem. I'm, I'm talking here as a chemist, so I'm presuming that we have chemistry in common. Um, and, and it immediately becomes obvious that then diversity of experience, diversity of life experience, diversity of language, diversity of training is a major asset in science. And so any argument that uh, there was actually a paper that was rapidly completely withdrawn. There was a paper published in uh, June of 2020 in one of the major German um, chemistry journals, journals Angewandte Chemie, where a chemist argued that diversity was uh, to the detriment of synthetic chemistry, which is the field that I operate in. So this argument is not irrelevant to science. It's very relevant to the conversations that we're currently having. And I think particularly in environments, uh, if you think about your, the, own, the environment in which you work, the academic environment in which you work, I would encourage you to consider what kinds of diversity are present amongst your colleagues. And is that, not only is that, uh, diversity in terms of the science important, but diversity in terms of the ideas that we bring to our educational process. So I'll stop there. Wow. That is, a, and you leave your camera on because now we're going to interrogate this. Okay, um, that's wonderful food for thought. Um, what's interesting is that I noticed that as we navigated the epistemic plane, we got shorter and shorter the way, the, that we moved away from purist from the right hand side as we moved to the left hand side we got shorter and shorter and yet industry tells us and our employees tell us we need more on the left hand side so um uh there was a question earlier uh but max keep your camera on um i'm wondering if my colleagues well ilza's on i can see everyone else that i can see here if you'd like to pick up the noah aspect, the, this integrating the knower, enabling or recognizing the knower in this STEM space. You know, we spoke in earlier sessions and certainly in engineering, or in our engineering session, you can't constantly saw that move towards just using semantics, context, implied kinds of knowers, but there was no problem. We didn't problematize exactly what that meant or, or what that entailed, other than that it entailed complexity. Um, I think that this is a wonderful opportunity for our colleagues on the side of STEM, um, you know, to pitch in here. Um, is there a way? How do how do we do that then? How do we acknowledge the knower in these so called hardcore spaces where we're assuming fundamental purist and doctrinal insights are and at best then situational because there are different affordances or different resources in different contexts. How do you actually do that practically? Max, I'm asking you. Sure. So, so I, I think there are two things here. One is that we, we can't hope to do it educationally in the educational space if we don't first bring that clarity within the fact that it is fundamental to the practice itself. So it's fundamental to our research. And having made that point, then we can say, okay, if it's fundamental to our research, how do, how, how do we begin to induct students into this? How do we make the distinction between the rationality that we need, which is um, embedded in the strong understanding of the subject? That is absolutely necessary. And in coming to that understanding, we will, we will bring different, the, our students will bring different insights along the way into the classroom. So one of the ways that, and I've talked about this in terms of the decolonization work that I've done um, along the way, one of the ways that I do that is by, say for example, the classic example of um, talking about molecule spinning, and the example that gets used in all the textbooks is think about an ice skater, 
and the difference in the speed of spinning when they have their arms out as opposed to when they have their arms in, which is a lovely example, except ice skating. Yes, exactly. So the way that I deal with that is because basically my, my capacity to think about different ways of expressing that is very limited. Even if it weren't very limited, um, it's still just my capacity. So what I normally do in those kind of situations is say, this is the example that, that gets used in the textbook. Let's talk about other examples that might be used. What do you think when you think about that? What do you think about, how would you illustrate that to the person sitting next to you? And I get, it, it's much harder to do in the online space, but in the pre-COVID times, what I do is get the students to talk in groups of two or three, and then say, okay, what are some of those examples? And the point there is that it's saying your experience, you are bringing your experience uh, into the classroom. It's being valorized in the classroom. And this is part of what you use to understand. We all use mental models. And then there's a discussion of, okay, that's a good model. This one, not mm, this doesn't work. And here's why that doesn't work. So it's a real, um, it's a moment of real, you can use that as a moment of real teaching. Uh, so it's in service of uh, in service of the knowledge, but you're you're bringing the particularity of the student into the space. And I'm sure there are many other ways to do it, but this is the way that I normally it's the the illustration I use when I talk about this stuff. I can say that um, Debbie says she has to leave now, and I know she has to leave very soon. But I think it connects to good, Christine. Your hands up. I'll come to you in a second. It's exactly what um, uh, Debbie. It was saying in the chat, you know, um, drawing the students into that space. I've always argued that our students are our most undervalued resource that we actually have to ourselves as educators and to themselves as, as peers kind of thing. Um, and I think this connects to two things. What Debbie was saying earlier about in the intercultural communication space where, uh, or she was describing something else, when she tells them about her own experience of working in the US and working in Europe, for example, her sharing that locates her, gives her a certain position, gives, gives her students a perspective on her insight. She is, although she's teaching the material science and she's gonna have exactly the same replicable results in the analysis of material failure. There is a context of herself as a knower with different kinds of experiences that possibly doesn't frame or dictate the grasp of the concept she's dealing with, but it frames the affective space in which that learning is happening. Mm. In other words, I think it connects to the identity and belonging because there's another generative mechanism at play there yeah. that we so do not, that we so ignore. Yeah. Uh, yes. What students have said in their feedback, says Debbie, in the chat here, makes them excited about becoming engineers. That's exactly what we're talking about. We're talking about identity at multiple levels here, underpinning the space that cannot be ignored. Go for it, Christine. No, thanks, uh, Max. I just wanted to say I love what you said just now. And I always think it is, it is so important, especially in the first year, because the students are so scared to relate their experiences to what they learn. You would give them a problem, which is let's say a whatever swing, and they will be, they will get an answer that doesn't um, relate to the experience and they will think it's right because the, they worked it out, you know, math, math. And then I, I would want to say to them, no, you have to evaluate your answer by thinking of your experience. Your experience mm. is real. <laughs> Yes. But yeah, so just my, my bit. <laughs> yes, thank you for that, Christine. Finally, go for it. You've been very quiet. <laughs> Hi, Corin and everybody else who's quiet but enjoying it. What, what an amazing day. It started really early this morning, so my batteries mm. are, are going flat soon. Um, it just, what, what hit me while I was listening to Max and Max answering the question as well is what, what you, that you've talked about now, Max and Christine to some degree, and Debbie is, is that bit of contextualizing and bring the, bringing the student experience into that. And um, the fact that we actually need to know our students, which I think sometimes scares some of us as scientists. I'm reminded of a colleague I worked with a long time ago, Ed Jacobs, Max, you knew, knew him. He yeah. knew all his students by name. 
But failing that, at least collaborating with them. So, you know, it doesn't always have to be that scary as I know who all my students are and what they bring. I can ask them as you've pointed out and as Debbie have pointed out. But I want to add something else here, which is um, less practical possibly, but I also think just making explicit the rules of the game, that which Cara and all your people in engineering are doing with LCT, uh, for ourselves starting to understand what the rules of the game of becoming legitimate knowers are so that we can make them explicit for our students and help them become legitimate knowers as part of, of this thing of bringing the knower in. So it's putting a bit more responsibility on me than just standing up there and explaining the concepts and then leaving again, um, if that makes sense a very important thing um, and I wanted to go back to an earlier comment and Christine please don't forget what you've asked uh, into uh, but it connects to what you were asking of Ingrid uh, someone earlier I'm sorry I missed mm -hmm. it said do you make these explicit to the yeah. students um, and I, I know Christine you want to ask Ingrid that in terms of the the mathematics and I know that in the science faculty you've already started to explore making these explicit but I, I just want to say that I think the process has been in reverse in a sense in engineering, in that when I moved into the faculty in 2015 already, there were a number of knowers with intuitively good practices or, or under the circumstances, you know, innovative, young, maybe not young, uh, young in the space, new in the academic space very often. And I think what I brought to that space was a set of tools which explain to them how come those things were working. Mm -hmm. And then that moved into, okay, but then what are the gaps? And slowly exploring the other instruments, how come something's not working and how can we use a different tool? So we're in a space now where you guys are at in the science faculty where you explicitly sat down with these tools to interrogate to evaluate the efficacy of some things, looking at the assessments, analyzing those assessments. So there's been a bit of a, because the nature of the fields are such that those practices are different in the in engineering practice and scientific practice too. And can you see how as a, as a collective group at Stellenbosch, we've, we've been different kinds of knowers working different kinds of ways, but because we collaborate in this broader STEM space, I think that just even today, this mm. learning from each other, and I think that collectively we're ready to tackle the challenge of how do we now make this explicit to students? Do we take an instrument and show, a la Lee Ruzniak and the whole Witz group and Rhodes, for example, as well, or Makanda, and all, it, 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 what they do in the social sciences is they teach them these, these tools and say, this is what we're doing and how you're learning not only in education, but in writing and all of those other things. Do we in the STEM space now take these tools and use them to unpack the hidden curriculum, to show them code shifting? You know, Do we structure an assessment in such a way that we have a little graphic of, let's say the epistemic plane going, here we're gonna ask you some fundamental purist questions. Next section of the assessment, here we're now gonna do doctrinal stuff. Now we move into situational. And then we place a question saying, offer me something from a knower perspective on whatever this is. Christine, go for it. Max I'm, and Christine. I'm gonna yeah. jump in and say that's that's exactly what we, we we're doing in chemistry. Okay. That that we are coding all our well, organic chemistry. We're coding all our tests, all our exams, so that the student knows what level of question that they're answering. And most of them use it pragmatically. Yes. But a small number of students uh, use it to, they are clearly beginning to understand the structure of knowledge, right? So they understand what knowledge building is now in a way that they did not before. So there's a whole yeah, new I've using, been using it also to some extent, but not using the word yet, no, not telling the students <laughs> semantic gravity, but telling them how many marks will there be on certain types of questions. And I think they, it really gives them a bit of comfort also to, to have that insight into the structure of things. But I think the time is there to, to explain the, the full theory to them. Mm. So I, I would really want to, I don't know if uh, uh, Neo, if you wanted to, I can't remember if your mic is working. No, because somebody's mic wasn't working. 
Nao. Uh, I, I think it was Danny's that wasn't Oh, working. it's Danny's. Yes, Nao. Uh, tell us a little bit about your approach shifting on the epistemic plane with the peer learning. Have you been teaching the students the plane? It was only in the second year of offering that um, mm -hmm. concept video assignment um, where even that I made it optional where I, I gave a short five minute presentation of this is how certain this is how knowledge can be structured into certain sections on a Cartesian plane of some sorts um, and my goal there wasn't so much to overwhelm them with the theory because I, I didn't think that they would like it at all and it would turn them away from the tasks mm -hmm. so instead I said for each quadrant of the epistemic plane, there's certain questions that they can ask themselves when they're trying to compile the, the narrative, the speech that they're going to give in their video. And in order to give the most robust speech as possible, they should try to answer questions from each quadrant. And I give examples of what those types of questions would be and why it would be useful to answer those questions. That's fascinating. Did you have any feedback on that from students? Um, not directly. Um, I, I think maybe one or two might have given some feedback and the, um, the survey will ask them after the task, but we, we mm. haven't had a, um, a time, some time to look at that in detail mm. yet. Mm. Um, uh, sorry, just last comment. What I did, um, what I do remember was there was a student that was running a bit late just in general and was uh, probably going to submit his assignment later and one query that he had a concern that he had was that um, he hasn't had time to look at everything and he still wants to look at those epistemic plane LCT slides as well um, and I was like no but that is not necessary it's just an extra so I, I think to some degree as much as it would be very useful to introduce the students to the tools they might feel like it's one extra thing that they have to master in order to pass the module. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, Nao thank you so much that's fantastic uh, from you. Um, um, in terms of the, the fluid semantic wave connection and the students doing their own projects. And it's connected, it's, it's part of that bigger picture that Robbie Potts and his colleagues have been working on. Um, what I wanted to say though, it speaks to something that occurred in the CPUT sessions earlier, where the whole point about the internal language of description, we are all, we are straight on that. You know, as a field, we're working in the space, et cetera. It's that translation device thing. It's that external language of description. It's that movement there. and not only speaking to data, but now we're talking about using it in a space where exactly as Nao has pointed out, being afraid to overwhelm people that they feel is something extra, but translating in such a way, the same as you guys have done in organic chemistry, Mags, in terms of your assessment coding, um, and the same as Nao was talking about, keeping it simple, but helping them to navigate their way, but recognizing that there are differences. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Hanley, your hand is up. I see we've only got a, two minutes left. A minute. Minute. Yeah, I'll try and make it a, a minute. minute. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'll try and fit it into a minute. I, I think just a quick response to both Nay and Christine. Um, we often hear students asking for old exam papers, but I think this way of starting to make to, to take that black box effect away from assessment um, is already a step in the right direction and in a much better direction than just the old exam papers. Uh, but just quickly, Karen, you said earlier, you know, using the epistemic plane and then asking students to, to give us something in that NOAA quadrant. And just from a past experience, Max, that you and I had when we asked something similar in the science and context course, um, highlighted for me that our science students also struggle with the NOAA aspects, um, with knowing what it is that we want in that quadrant. So I'm fully for it. But I realized after that attempt of ours that we need to think very carefully how we frame that question so that we know what it is that we want them uh, to bring in, into the situation. I think your earlier explanation, Max, um, serves as, as, as an example of how to do it well. Though. Um, but just to, to highlight that point, they also already come in, um, what's the right word, socialized into seeing science as this a human thing. Um, yeah. Colleagues, thank you so much. We are, uh, time has run out. I just want to say thank you for the wonderful collaboration. And I see us, uh, you know, going forward with this um, at the institution, even more formally. I think science and engineering need to come together. I think we need to create opportunities, whether it is, you know, once every three months, let's have a morning, let's do something 
because we, I certainly know that I think that your approach to the assessments and coding those is so illuminating. And I think that could really help with the engineering faculty, certainly. So thank you so much to all the organizers of all these fantastic uh, opportunities. I assume that they're going to cut us out because we're going to the movies now. It's six o'clock on the dot in South Africa.